Canine Chat. News, tips, expert guests and reviews. Whether you're a trainer, handler or just want to learn more about your best friend, here's Paul the Dog Trainer with Canine Chat. The following podcast may have information relevant to you. However, it's based on the knowledge and experience of those involved. For advice more specific to your situation, please consult a professional. And welcome back to another episode of Canine Chat. Today we have a very special guest on the line, the lovely Laura from Dognative Therapy. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now, it's good. I've had a lot of requests to have you on the show today, so I thought it would be a good treat for my listeners to actually listen to someone like you who has such experience and, and everything in your field. Did you want to just touch on a little bit about yourself and, and your dog and sort of where you where you came from? Yeah, sure, Paul. Look, um, you know, I've been, I suppose, working with animals and understanding their behavior since I could walk and talk. And um, I, I, I studied lots of things and um, then, of course, you know, ended up working at Melbourne Zoo, uh, looking more into animal behavior. And then I got my dog, Chester, um, just over five years ago. And all throughout my life, I, I sort of felt like I had... Um, some sort of ability to try and see where other animals are coming from, some sort of empathy, I suppose. And when I got my dog, Chester, it was, I just realized how important it is to actually, um, when you want to have a happy relationship with another animal or even another human, to actually understand where an animal's point of view is or where they're trying to come from. And I I became really even more so passionate about this and um, started doing it as a career pretty much, just helping people to understand, you know, if you want to have a happy healthy relationship with your dog you really need to start to understand where they're coming from and um, you know through, through doing that you become you know a much a much better leader a much better care of your dog and, and a much happier relationship with your dog yeah it's, I, I, I want to touch on a note that you said about understanding from their perspective uh, I've got a yep. friend who actually worked at Melbourne Zoo I think with you uh, David okay he was uh, one of the guys that worked with uh, a few of the elephants and things like that uh, and yep. Yeah, and um, yep. and uh, I actually went there one day um, a few months ago uh, behind the scenes with some of the seals and to see the way they mm-hmm. were training the seals and things like that. And for yep. me, I know I don't know yep. anything about seals. I don't know the first thing about <laughs> training a seal. I don't know, you know, whether it's just it's positive reinforcement based on food, and I wouldn't know how to actually train a seal to do anything. You know, whether you're shaping it or whatever method you use. Uh, so, you know, it makes it hard. It makes me understand more about my clients and how they feel with dogs when they don't understand dogs as well as maybe I do or some other people do and they can't yeah. seem to get a, a touch on the behaviors. And I find that most of the behaviors that I see stem from the owner not really understanding what the dog's trying to say or they assume the dog's saying one thing, so they treat yep. that one thing but they forget to treat the, the real cause of the problem. Yeah, we, t- we tend to see dogs as, you know, expecting them to be able to read our minds and, and know exactly what we want from them. And it's interesting how you said, you know, you can understand how your clients feel when you're when you're working with an animal and you don't know much about them, you don't know how to train them. But imagine what it's like for that seal <laughs> who's trying to, you know, understand everything that you're expecting from them. And one of the problems that, you know, most people have, and it's no one's fault, but it's, it's more about, um, you know, inconsistent, rewarding, you know, not actually having um, a clear idea of what you want from your dog and not communicating to them exactly what you know um, maybe that, what they want from you and what one of the problems that people run into when they don't understand where their dog's coming from is of course um, all sorts of behavior problems and that's why you and I get called up so much um, because quite simply we just don't understand what our dog's trying to say yeah oh, a few years ago well before I was I was a dog trainer this was back in 97 I think it was and I went to Thailand for a couple of weeks uh, to visit a friend of mine and it's really, it was really hard for me to communicate with people over there because I, I couldn't mm. speak their language. And it was yep. very hard for them to try and communicate with me because they didn't really speak much English or they had very broken English. And, mm. it, it, you know, it, it would make it much easier uh, in this situation with dogs is a lot of people tend to talk to their dogs or use very long <laughs> sentences when the dog doesn't know what they're saying. So, for example, uh, recall command with my dog is just I, I use their name to get their attention and I, a simple here. Uh, yep. at, you know, a lot of people would say, come here right now or get over here. We've got to go. And, and those sort of things, unless you teach a dog exactly what that means, they're not going to understand and they're going to get more confused. And they look at you with that confused look. And then yep. you, you, you think that confused look is something like, uh, you know, the dog's just defying you or something. And you think, oh, he's yep. a cheeky little thing, but he's actually looking at you. Like, I have no idea what you're saying. Can you please be clear? Yep. And, yeah, and that's absolutely. the main thing. Um, did you, I want to talk about 
uh, how our energy affects our dog, first of mm -hmm. all, just so we can start the process off with uh, a few of my clients that I see when they want to go for a walk and their dog's pulling. Now, mm. it, I could walk outside and stop the dog pulling in, in a matter of minutes, but it's more yeah. the lead up to the pulling, which is the most important, which is they put their shoes on, the dog starts panting heavily and pacing, mm. and then yeah. they grab the lead, the dog starts jumping all over them, and it really starts mm -hmm. from that. Do you want to talk a bit about how our energy affects our dog and what it means to be calm and, and get the dog to be compliant and calm before you move on? Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Look, I mean, um, you know, it's so important that when you're going to do something with your dog that you're communicating to them um, that, you know, there are certain behaviours that are safe and there are certain behaviours that are not safe. And overexcitable, anxious, um, demanding, controlling behaviour for a dog is really not a safe state of mind or behaviour for a dog. So anytime, you know, people are rewarding excitable, anxious, pushy, needy, demanding behaviours, um, even if they feel sorry for their dog, they're actually behaving to their dog's detriment. And, you know, the, the way that, um, you know, you're feeling and the way you're responding and the, what you're reinforcing with your dog, um, the dogs pick up on how you're feeling even before you know how you're feeling. And I'm sure you already know when you're, when you're working with people and they're putting the lead on and the dog's jumping up on them and already that person's feeling anxious and frustrated as well. So it's so important that if you expect your dog to feel calm and, you know, positive and feeling trust and respect for you, that you have that same energy with your dog. Because if you don't, as their leader, if you're anxious and frustrated and worried and don't have control of that situation your dog's going to be an absolute mess and this is so common and it's no one's fault um, I can understand how frustrating and, and you know anxious it, it makes people feel um, but you really just need to stop and take a deep breath and think from your dog's perspective how would I feel if you know someone was holding onto a leash that was attached to me and they felt no control um, they were frustrated and anxious and they were about to take me into an environment that's unpredictable and uncontrollable I mean you're basically setting your dog up to fail um yeah so look I, I always really want people just to have a calm energy um and to have just have consistent expectations don't give your dog what they want if they're not in that right state of mind um but at the same time cooperate with your dog for example you know you were saying you know you can get your dog to walk on lead beautifully within a couple of minutes but your client may you know spend you know days weeks years um frustrated by not being able to to get what they want from their dog and it's not like you and I are some sort of genius you know, we're not doing anything um, amazing. It's really just about having that calm, assertive energy and following through, being consistent and communicating very simply to your dog. This is what I want from you. Every time you do it, I'll give you what you want. Every time you don't do it, I consistently won't give you what you want. It's really, really just simple stuff. I like what you touch on about not being geniuses. And I talk to my clients about this quite a lot. <laughs> And I, they, yep. they sometimes think that I've sedated their dog with some kind of food that I've got in my pouch. And it's not... <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if you could Yeah, do that? <laughs> it would be great if it was that easy. Yeah. And it's not... Um, or, or sometimes I, there's reactive dogs and they hand me the lead and the dog stops reacting. Now, I don't have any special powers over the dog. It's just... It's purely no. techniques, uh, energy and body language. It's all I use. I don't use anything else. The dog just yeah. understands what I want and what's expected. It, it, and I try to explain it without getting too into detail about... Uh, dogs are not humans, but I do use a lot of human analogies to help people understand because people do mm. understand humans. And I talk about uh, having a, a dog that doesn't think you're in control but then tries to take control because a lot of what mm. dogs do is about trying to take control over and if they can't control a situation or someone else hasn't got control, then they have no choice but to take over. And yeah. a similar situation to if you have a, a three- or four-year-old child and you, you know your house gets broken into and your four-year-old's like, don't worry, I've got this, and starts trying to go at the <laughs> intruder, it's going to make for a very stressful situation because yeah. they feel like they need to control. Now, especially with dogs, as I said, I don't really have any special powers and most dog trainers would admit they don't, but we do know how to stay calm and, and assertive in situations that we probably uh, feel like we don't want to be calm or assertive. If I have a dog that's lunging at me or any kind of situation that, that it was uh, happening, it's, it's hard, mm. but you've got to stay that way for the sake of the dog. Yeah, and look, it, there's no point when I have any of my consultations or when I'm working with any dog, there's no point throughout that session where I ever think that I'm not 100% in control. It's just... It's part of, you know, your energy and your belief within what you're doing because if you don't think that you are, you really shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Now, the problem for that is that 
we say, you know, it's your energy, you know, um, it's about being assertive. Those sorts of concepts are not very tangible for people. Like they'll say, well, what do you mean about my energy? How do I actually have an energy like you do? And I guess the reason why um, I, I sort of try to explain that more is because otherwise, you know, it's all well and good for us to have that energy, but to actually put the lead in the owner's hand and say, just have a, a, an assertive energy is like, you know, what the hell does that mean? So um, that's why I, I try to keep it quite simple for people. And when you're first starting and you don't feel like you're 100% in control and you're not sure exactly what you're doing, that's fine. Just set yourselves up to win. So if you have a dog that's, you know, um, pulls on lead, um, spend the first, you know, three or four or five days not even getting to the stage where you're going for a walk, but starting to feel like you're in control in the home where your dog's starting to respond and respect and trust you when you're putting on the lead. And set yourself up to win because what happens often is people see what we do and they think, oh, must be you know pretty easy which which it is but then they go and they set themselves up to fail and it can become frustrating so one of my golden rules is set yourself and your dog up to win don't put yourself in a situation if you're not 100 percent confident that you can actually win that situation instead yeah. build your build yourself up to that if that makes sense yeah it does and on that yeah. note also also with um and you i'm sure you'd get this as well i mean i, I can't be the only dog trainer yeah. that gets this but People will have a dog and they'll say to me, I want my dog to be calm uh, at the park under distractions and come when cold when there's other dogs around. But oh, so that's, okay. the, that's obviously the, the, end, <laughs> the end goal is, is obviously that. That's, there's nothing wrong with having an end goal. But it, mm. it doesn't start mm. there. It starts in the home. You've got to get your dog to be able mm. to come to you with no distractions, with nothing around before you can even yeah. progress to, uh, you know, out of park with, with many distractions. So like you're saying about the loose lead walking and things like that, I find people try and uh, go too far too soon. So they try yeah. and walk in front of, uh, you know, certain houses or something like that. And it's okay if I'm there with them and I can show them how to control. Uh, it works okay. But then once I leave, they, they try and do that and they can spend the next few months being frustrated and, and it just make, you know goes backwards and you don't want that. Yeah. And the thing is with dog training, I mean, my, my mantra is really dog training is not about dogs, it's about people. So it's really so important to um, to train that person and positively reinforce them and set them up to win and help them understand how to communicate before you're even thinking about working with the dog. Because ultimately, you know, we're not the dog trainer, the owner is. And that's where, you know, my role is to become that person of that human to, to get those skills, to get that confidence and to reinforce their skills to then go and train their dog. Because unfortunately, you know, we, we don't live with our clients. We can't be there for them 24 hours a day. Um, I have had a few offers really... to live with people, but yeah. uh, I unfortunately can never take them on. <laughs> oh, I haven't had that offer. So could be you. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, no, well, some some people just occasionally, oh, can you live with us? Now, what, what, what do you want to talk about... Uh, this is something that I see people do all the time, and some people believe. I could preach this every day. I could talk about this on my Facebook page. I could. I could. There could be as yeah. much evidence in the world, but people will still always treat dogs like humans. And yep. I, I want to touch on. I want your opinion first, but I want you to touch on what do you classify as? You know, I suppose appropriate uh, treating dogs like humans and inappropriate treating dogs like humans, because I think there is a difference. Although, uh, as long as you, you know, in my opinion, treating a dog like a human is okay if it doesn't affect the dog whatsoever but in most cases it will and yeah. you need to sort of and look at it from the know? dog yeah exactly yeah. um yeah. so i just think it's back to treating dogs like dogs and and people sort of misunderstand treating a dog like a dog doesn't mean you treat them badly doesn't mean they get no. uh you know you leave them outside you know their whole life into a ditch with no kennel like a, a dog uh, <sighs> it just means treat them like a dog and respect their breed and respect their nature and understand what their instincts are what energy means, how they communicate and all that sort of thing. But do you want to touch on what you sort of see about yeah. that? Yeah. Look, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and it's all well and good to say that. But the whole reason why people get companion dogs is to have them as, you know, human equivalent companions. And um, I think, you know, we can't be too hard on ourselves. I mean, dogs have been, you know, in our lives for thousands and thousands, you know, almost tens of thousands of years. And um, they have been bred and have survived by our side through understanding our body language, understanding our energy and understanding where we're coming from. Um, so I think dogs are pretty adaptable. They tend to do pretty well in suffering <laughs> being, you know, a human baby. Um, 
and but one of the problems of course is that you know they're, they're not a human um you know i don't treat my friends like a different species i treat them as human beings with trust and respect and i think that you know if dogs have spent you know thousands of years working for us at some point i think we need to go well how can i work for you what can i do for you what do you need um and so you know, oh, here's my dog now. Hey, Chester. Sorry, Chester's you know, making a special appearance on the podcast today. Sorry about that. <laughs> He's always by my side. Yeah. Um, so, look, um, they're not human, um, but they are equivalent, really, in so many ways of a three-year-old child. Now, I don't treat a three-year-old child like an adult. I treat them um, quite differently. And, and just like, you know, three-year-old children, dogs need consistent boundaries. They need um, effective black and white communication. They need to be set up to win. They need to be reinforced for doing the right behaviours. If you can provide that sort of leadership, um, but you can still have a, an affectionate, you know, beautiful relationship with your dog where sometimes you treat them a bit like a human, sometimes they treat you a bit like a dog, I think it can work. Um, but you have to be careful because there is a fine line in that and you need to be able to become... I think all owners should do a, a, a course in body language and understanding what their dog's thinking. And if you can see that your dog, as a consequence of the way you're treating them, is suffering from anxiety, is, is frustrated, is, um, you know, not sure what they're supposed to do, doesn't trust, doesn't respect you, isn't listening to you, then perhaps you need to think, well, the way I'm treating my dog right now isn't working for them and they're letting me know and what can I do to make them understand that I'm respecting them as a dog first and human second, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes total sense and I, I agree with you totally. Um, the only thing I'll say... Uh, in regards to dogs and, and three-year-old kids, and this is something that um, I want to touch on, it doesn't mean yeah. that uh, if there's a certain, you know, you're not going to put a halty or a correction chain on a child, but you may put no. one on a dog to, to teach it something or, or to help it through a situation, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. So they may they may think like children in some respects, or, uh, you know, they need the same kind of guidance, but it doesn't mean that you have to treat them the same way as you would a three-year-old, because I often get Absolutely. Uh, the, yeah, the occasional no. people... Uh, you know, would you put this on a three-year-old kid or would you would you tell off a three-year-old kid for this and that sort of thing? But uh, they may think similar, but they don't need the same kind of, um, you know, you don't, you know, put food down your yeah. kid's mouth for sitting well uh, or something. So it's one of those one of yeah. those sort of fine lines. But Absolutely, yeah. I was just going to say, look, it's, it's about, you know, when I sort of say, you know, a three-year-old child, because it's more about the cognitive ability, you know, yeah. in terms of the, the potential to learn, understand and perceive this world. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the way that you behave with them is different because um, children are human and we have this innate ability to communicate effectively with each other because we're the same species, otherwise we'd be extinct. Um, and, you know, dogs, you know, they're, they're motivated differently. You know, when they do something right, instead of, you know, um, you smiling and saying, what a great job and giving your child a hug, a dog might want a treat. So that's another thing that I just quickly want to touch on, if that's okay. Sure. Is, is understanding what your dog's motivated by. So often I see people, um, you know, a dog will be sitting um, at the back door wanting to come in and we've taught them to sit and wait patiently. And, of course, I ask the, you know, I'll ask my client, you know, what does your dog want now? And they'll say, oh, I'll go and give him a treat. So they'll go and give him a treat and then close the door and leave the dog back outside. And I'll say, is that what the dog wanted? Is the dog motivated by that? What does that dog actually want? And they realise the dog actually wants to come inside. So it's so important that, you know, amongst all these things that we've sort of been talking about, that you understand what your dog wants at that time. If you don't understand what your dog wants at that time, then you can't cooperate and they're not going to learn to do that behaviour again. Yeah, so, it's, it's you know, motivation is such an important part of dog training. So I totally agree with that. And one thing that I, I talk about all the time uh, with regards to dogs and motivation is you need to find out what your dog is motivated by, not what your dog enjoys or likes, but really, really motivated by. I mean, mm. my my German Shepherd, he'll if I give him a, a you know a, a little dried biscuit or something, he'll eat it. But mm. if I give him cabana or hot dogs, he will like it much, much more. And mm -hmm. if if he has a chance of uh, doing something or coming back to me uh, with a high reward, then he's going to come back a lot more than. Uh, if it's something that's like you know not as not as high value, and uh, this was trained to me uh, a while ago in uh, some techniques with food refusal, when you mm -hmm. want a dog to refuse food, and they do, so you reward them with something else. But what they really want is that food that they refused. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sometimes when you're training food refusal or any kind of thing like that, you should actually reward the dog with the food that they refused, or at least that the similar type of product. So because that's what totally. they really want. I mean, if they if a dog wants uh, something and you give them something else, they'll take it. Yes. But they may not work next time for it exactly. because they're not they're not yeah, getting the exactly what they want. And and I <laughs> yeah. talk and and I do touch on 
each dog has every single dog is motivated by something and if you sit there and think my dog's not motivated by food my dog's not motivated by toys you just haven't found the right toy the right food because every dog so if they true. weren't motivated they'd be dead they they exactly want, there's something that motivates them and yeah. you just got to find what that is and with one of uh, with my german shepherd uh, he loves tug of war but not every mm-hmm. tug that he likes. He only likes certain ones. And um, yeah. So there's no point if I play tug of war with with a puppy tug or something. He's, he'll play, but he's he'll still you know kind of look look around and and wonder what else he can do. But there's mm-hmm. this one Absolutely. there's this one tug of war toy that he loves so much that it doesn't matter what's going on. He will always 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 want to play or always hang around. So that's important to actually know exactly what the motivation is. Now, Absolutely. this is something with Chester. Um, I do want to touch on him because he's like a bit of a celebrity yep. uh, nowadays. I'm looking at him right now. <laughs> uh, with yep. things like, um, you know, riding skateboards and surfing and that sort of stuff, which he's known for. But oh, yeah. did, did you want to talk about, uh, you know, in a, in a fast track way, how you sort of taught that behavior? Uh, now, and, you know, people listening probably won't be able to follow as much with exactly how to do it. But just to let people know that it can actually be easy to train dogs to do complex skills with just a little bit of time and a little bit of patience? Because I, I think yeah. overall, it probably didn't take you that long to train him to ride a skateboard time-wise, no. but it may have taken yeah. you two or three weeks to do it, but it may have been two or three minutes a day. It's not a very long yeah. time. because, uh, And I want to segue into mental exercise because a lot of people don't provide their dog with enough mental exercise yeah. as well. So do you want to touch on that now? Yeah, and that was, you know, it's a good segue in from talking about motivation um, because a, a, complex, a complex trick is really not so complex as long as you've got your dog, you know, wanting to work for you, getting excited about it and having a great time. Um, and, you know, on, on your end, you just have to make sure that it's consistently enjoyable. For, for a complex trick, you know, you never enforce your dog to do something. They always have to volunteer to do it. They actually really want to do it. And so the most important thing when you're teaching a dog something, um, particularly if it's a new thing, is to understand what your dog's motivated by. For example, you know, if I'm doing scent detection with Chester, he's not made of, motivated by food. He's motivated by a tug of war. If I'm, you know, teaching him to ride a skateboard, he's motivated by food. So find exactly what your dog wants at that time, and that's your golden rule or your step one. With um, with a, riding a skateboard, it's so easy. People go, how did you teach your dog to do that? And it's really just about um, step-by-step reinforcement. And uh, often, you know, having your dog clicker train is a really good way to, to be able to mark a behavior that you want. But you don't need a clicker. You can just have a word. So I, I sometimes use the word yes. Sometimes I have a clicker. So it's just a, a, um, a marking or a noise that lets up that dog know they've done the right thing and there's something good coming afterwards. So um, for, for the, the skateboard, I, I use clicker. So I just have a skateboard just on the carpet inside, making sure it didn't move. It wasn't going to make any noises. It wasn't going to be scary. And I just sat there with Chester's favorite food and I just let him look at it. And every time he looked at it, I'd click and reward. And then he'd get really excited. He'd go, oh, my God, that skateboard's awesome. Every time I look at it, I get some bit of sausage or something. And so he'd start running a bit closer to it and I'd click and reward. And then, you know, after maybe, you know, three or four days, i put that skateboard down and he'd be going and putting his first paw on it. Um, so I'd click. And what, what ha- was a really good idea when you're teaching a dog to learn something new is to violate their expectations. So you give them more than what they're expecting. And then they learn that if they do that again, that's going to be a really, really good idea. So when he did something remarkable, like put two paws on that skateboard, I'd click and give him five bits of sausage instead of one, if that makes sense. So he's like, oh my God, this is awesome. I'm going to put both my paws on again. Um, and eventually, you know, you have to be a little bit patient with your dog and the dog has to be patient with you because there'll be times where they'll be trying to figure out exactly what you want and they don't know so they'll be trialing and erroring different things and eventually through a little bit of frustration he figured out that not only did he have to put two paws up he had to put his back left paw up as well and then as soon as he started doing that then I moved him onto a different um, floor one that moved and eventually through all positive experiences he learned that if he put his first two paws up and one back paw and he actually made himself move he'd get 10 bits of sausage and then we'd finish so you always want to finish on a win or finish on a high and don't ever get frustrated by your dog and probably it took me about a week and a half two weeks to get him pushing himself along on a skateboard on the road really easy now when you talk about clicker training and this is something yep. that um, that I want if, if people have a clicker or if they want to go and buy one or if they can simply yeah. use the word yes. Um, a, a cool game that you can play is yep. with other people. So you can actually get 
uh, someone else, for example, uh, I could hold a clicker and I could get you along. And I mm-hmm. could I could have this sort of uh, thing that I wanted you to do, for example, might mm-hmm. pick up a pen or something like that, and then mm-hmm. I could actually click or say yes when you look at the pen and see if I can get you to work out what behaviour I'm trying to teach. Does that yep. make sense? So, it's so much fun. And that yeah, way you we can, do that often. Yeah. yeah, and that will sort of give you an idea of how frustrating it can be for a dog because the person that's trying to work out what the behaviour is, whether it's picking up a pen or whatever it is, uh, and the person mm. who's clicking and saying yes, it can actually be quite confusing. And it will give you an idea what your dog is probably thinking when you're doing that. Absolutely. Like, um, you know, at, at the zoo where I work, um, so I'll, I'll run workshops there sometimes. And we talk about, you know, animals where, you know, if they don't do what you want them to do, then there's nothing you can do about it. An example of that is, of course, an elephant. <laughs> I mean, you can't enforce an elephant to do something um, if you want them to because they're, you know, 6,000 kilograms. Um, so we talk about capturing behaviours and that's exactly what this is. You know, when they just happen to do something you want, um, then you, you reward it. And I, I do that with people. I'll just put someone in front of the group and, you know, we'll, we'll all have our hands ready to clap when he does the right behaviour and that person will be standing going, what on earth do you want me to do? And they'll trial and error and they'll do a few things and then eventually they learn through you marking that behaviour what they want. But they always say, my God, that was so difficult to understand what you wanted from me. And it also emphasizes how important it is that you you mark that behavior. The timing is impeccable as well. Because if you're, you know, a couple of seconds too slow or a couple of seconds too quick, the dog learns something completely different and doesn't understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, that's fantastic. I hope a lot of people sort of have a bit of a go at this and have a bit of a practice. It's Um, so much fun. It's the best teaching your dog music. Yeah, I actually did it with... um, I uh, I don't know if you know Julia Kinghorn, um, but yep. she uh, she did some clicker training with me, and uh, I was incredibly <laughs> frustrated. I was yeah. I, I couldn't figure out like I, I literally I could not figure out what she wanted. Um, yep. And in the end, I did, but it was quite difficult. It wasn't something yep. that you think when when you're like whenever you can foresee something, uh, it's it's much harder to see from someone else's perspective. So when I'm trying to get my dog to ride a skateboard or whatever it is. In my mind, I'm thinking, it's just easy. Just go put your paw on it. But from the dog's yeah. perspective, they, they don't actually understand what they have to do. Um, yeah, and, and why would they do that? Why yeah. do you want me to do that? It just doesn't make yeah. sense. So and I think it's so some, important to be clear. Something yeah. you touch on all the time is about how dogs teach us. Now, in, in, when you're clicker training or when you're shaping behavior, in a way, your dog is actually teaching you or, or controlling you because Chester is learning that he can control your hand and your food pouch with what he does. So, yep. in a way, he's actually controlling everything that you do. And I talk about dogs being the best human trainers in the world, and they are, because they, they treat humans. And, and my dogs, uh, they teach me things every day. And yep. <laughs> things that I, I become a better dog trainer every day after working with my dogs because they teach me yeah. things that maybe I hadn't thought of before and, and things. And um, just to touch on, in case people want to um, have a go themselves with the skateboard and things like that, it is important that you don't have anything that can potentially scare the dog. And, and an example of that is when I started teaching Sergeant to open the fridge and get a drink out for me, um, I think at, at the time I was a little bit less experienced and uh, I think a magnet must have fallen off the, the fridge and hit the ground mm-hmm. and it, it startled him a little bit. And it took me mm-hmm. a long time just to get him back to, to finally sort of want to be comfortable near the fridge and learn something. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, important this- that whenever you're training a new behavior, as much as you can control the environment and control what goes on, so, and in some yeah. cases with skateboards, they might even take the wheels off and just put the board on the ground. I know some trainers absolutely. that do that. So it really depends. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, Paul, I made a rookie mistake with the skateboard as well. You know, I had a Herald Sun shoot um, quite a while ago. And I guess when photographers want a photo, they're really willing to push your limits. And um, we, were, we were doing sort of two, three hours of skateboarding, which is ridiculous, you know, in hindsight. And, um, you know, after that, that, period of time where Chester's limits were pushed with the skateboard, he ended up actually finding the skateboard quite aversive afterwards. So it took me another month to get him to change the way he was seeing that skateboard and make it into a positive thing again. So you're absolutely right. You really have to control that environment and make sure you're setting your dog up to win um, as much as you possibly can. Otherwise, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, definitely. And I think we're just about out of time, but I, can you please just touch on, uh, I do want to talk about your doggy bag. If you want to send people yep. over to your website and, and check out your doggy bag, because that would be a, a great addition to any any family, I think. Yeah, look, it's um, the doggy bag is um, it's basically a transportable safe place. Um, and so, you know, speaking of control and things like that, 
often when dogs are anxious or unsure about a certain situation, they just don't know what to do with themselves. So the doggy bag um, was developed to provide a, a, a safe place for a dog to go to where you encourage them or when they volunteer to go to that place, always positive things happen. And the good thing about the doggy bag is it's, transport it's transportable. You can take it in the car. You can take it all around the house. You can take it wherever you want to. It's waterproof, machine washable, and also it has a wrap around it. So if there's a thunderstorm or a situation in which your dog is not particularly um, good at dealing with, you can actually create a, pr a pressure wrap around it. So that comes with the doggy bag as well to help them settle down. And there's lots of evidence with people in particular and also dogs where applying a bit of pressure during a time of, of anxiousness really helps that dog or that person to calm down. So that's what the doggy bag is. And it's on my website and at a couple of pet shops, but I'll tell you my website is www.dogcognitivetherapy.com. And you can purchase it online. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today, Laura. No worries. Thanks so much for having me. Well, there we have it. Another episode of Canine Chat. All the links will be in the description. Thanks for joining us today and stay tuned for next week's episode.